So, I'm very late to the party, but I recently binge watched the Netflix docuseries Cheer, and it was great. I highly recommend it. There was, however, one line in it that gave me the idea for this video, and that is when someone said something to the effect of, what we do is serious, this isn't like bring it on. And it's true, when we're talking about physicality, what the real life cheerleaders in cheer go through is extremely intense and dangerous. <laughs> It makes the stunts in Bring It On look like playtime. But I just have to defend the movie against the notion that it is a poor representation of cheerleaders. Because I think this classic, and yes it's a classic, deserves a ton of credit in completely changing up how they are portrayed in film and television. I'll be talking specifically about the first movie because I think, similar to American Pie, there's the classic and then there's the two billion sequels made after it. I'm of the opinion that there is a pre and post Bring It On landscape where what once was nothing but a stock character became something more. And that's what I'm gonna talk about today. First, let's talk about stock characters. A stock character is a stereotypical, one dimensional portrayal of a person in a fictional story who the audience instantly recognizes because they frequently encountered them, always in the same way. Now of course, usually when we talk about one-dimensional, stereotypical characters, it is in a negative way. But truth is, stock characters aren't automatically a bad thing. In fact, they are necessary a lot of the time. You simply can't develop every single character we see, and you don't need to. Take the wise old man for example. Whether it's Rafiki, or Aslan, or Master Rugwe, or a million others, when you see this stock character, you know exactly what you're getting. A wise old man that will deliver profound quotes. Yes, the past can't hurt. But the way I see it, you can either run from it, or learn from it. Things never happen the same way twice, dear one. Yesterday is history. Tomorrow is a mystery, but today is a gift. That is why it is called the present. They only exist in the story to use their wisdom to help the protagonist on their journey. There doesn't need to be more dimensions to them. Their purpose is fulfilled and despite them just being a stock character, they are extremely memorable and iconic. Here. This map is going to be your guide to North Shore. Now, where you sit in the cafeteria is crucial. There is nowhere stock characters thrive as much as they do than in teen movies and TV shows. Whether it's the popular girl, or the nerd, or the dumb blonde. Did you know that dolphins are just gay sharks? It works out great because you can fit a whole bunch of people in the runtime, they add to the high school atmosphere we are all familiar with, and they can just pop into a scene, do their job, and leave. Sometimes that job is to deliver stupid, funny one-liners, and that's okay. Karen Smith is a legend, and I think about her every day. I'm sorry I laughed at you that time you got diarrhea at Barnes & Noble, and I'm sorry I told everyone about it. And I'm sorry for repeating it now. But now that I've defended the stock characters, let's talk about when they become a problem. If I asked you to picture a high school movie jock, you would picture a young, good-looking, athletic, popular boy who walks around everywhere in his jersey. You would also probably picture him as dumb, or a bully, or a dumb bully. This isn't the most positive image, however luckily for the jock, he's also been given plenty of opportunities to show a more human, less shallow side to him. For as long as the negative depiction of him has existed, there have always been many movies made that sympathized with him. Commonly, you'll find that the jock has his own secret insecurities, such as being closeted, or they have problems at home such as overbearing parents that demand too much from them. The unflattering, one-dimensional depiction has always been balanced out by a compassionate one. The female equivalent, on the other hand, the cheerleader, for a long time was not given the same consideration. The cheerleader was an amalgamation of all the worst traits. Popular, promiscuous mean girl that travels in a clique and is hated by everyone apart from the boys that want to get with her. When we talk about the purpose of a stock character, the purpose of the cheerleader was to look good and a lot of the time be cruel and nasty. Boyfriend Billy. Maybe she's just like her mother. Please, it's a common fact. 
simultaneously be desirable and loathsome. Often they were simply used as a way to get us to sympathize with the protagonist who wasn't a cheerleader. Or in the case of Buffy Summers in Buffy the Vampire Slayer, the protagonist was a cheerleader but stopped being one once she got development beyond being a girl who only cared about shopping and being around her snobbish wealthy friends. I'm sure you can find a few exceptions, such as Sandy from Greece. Her version of the cheerleader represented an innocence to contrast with the pink ladies. But this is 1978 and you can even tell by the cheerleading costume alone, which consists of a sweater and a really long skirt, that this is a very different cheerleader to the one we are familiar with. What happened in the 80s and 90s is that the cheerleader became a stock character, a figure tacked onto a movie to represent the pecking order that exists in high schools, which, as with the jock, would be completely fine if it was balanced out with multiple humanized versions of her. But the potential that writers and filmmakers saw in the jock was not seen in the cheerleader. For far too long, she remained a vapid background character and nothing more. That is until August of 2000 when we got Bring It On. The opening scene of the movie is a cheer, with lyrics that flatly lay out exactly how the cheerleader archetype was used in stories at the time. Great hair! The boys all love to stare! I'm wanted! I'm hot! I'm everything you're not! It is a brilliant opening that first winks at the audience saying, yes, we are self-aware and we know that these are the stereotypes you have in mind coming into this movie. Then we are introduced to the protagonist. Torrance, in all her glory, she is beautiful and she knows it, she's the star of the show, staring directly into the camera, she blows a kiss and does her cute little cheer, when suddenly, we are no longer in this perfect cheerleader fantasy, but instead plunged into a nightmare, Torrance's nightmare, where she has no clothes on and is being laughed at by the entire gymnasium. It is not the cheerleader being cruel to everyone in school, but everyone in school being cruel to her. And then she wakes up and the movie begins. What I appreciate most about Bring It On is that it isn't simply, okay, let's take what is perceived to be an evil character and make her nice. Doing that isn't hard and it isn't revolutionary. So that's not where my praise is coming from. For a lot of the movie, Bring It On stays true to what we know the stereotypical cheerleader to be. The cheerleaders in Bring It On are still popular, still a little dumb, still pretty, still mean. Don't tell me Carver can cut school just because she broke her leg in three places. Hello, get a wheelchair. It then takes the time to get the audience to like and sympathize with them. And it doesn't do that through babying these characters and making them out to be major victims, but instead by taking you into their world, showing you the good and the bad, the ridiculous and the serious, showing you what they're thinking and what motivates them. And it does it through the primary plot of the movie, which isn't the love story between Torrance and Cliff Pantone. It's one of race, class, and cultural appropriation, which you really wouldn't expect from a typical teen comedy. I know you didn't think a white girl made that up. When Torrin Shipman achieves her goal of being the new captain of the Rancho Carne Toros, she's informed of the troubling truth that all of her squad's cheers were stolen from the East Compton Clovers. Immediately, it is obviously a race issue. The screenwriter, Jessica Bendinger, could have easily made it so that the routine was stolen from another squad of a similar makeup to the Toros. But no, they stole it from a primarily black squad that is also less affluent than the Toros, something we've seen repeatedly happen in real life to black entertainers both past and present. Guys, like every time we get some, here y'all come trying to steal it, putting some blonde hair on it, and calling it something different. This in and of itself is impressive of a high school teen comedy, but it goes even further because the execution of the storyline is pretty excellent. Torrance Shipman is neither completely guilty of the circumstance, how could she be when she wasn't the one that stole the cheers, and the movie makes it clear that she's horrified by it and feels guilty, but she's also not completely innocent. She plays her part and allows herself to be pressured by the rest of the squad to stick to the stolen cheers. Then you have the East Compton Clovers, led by Gabby Gabrielle Union. I would use the character's real name, but I don't want this video to get auto-demonetized. 
The Clovers aren't just helpless victims needing to be saved. They are tough and talented, they stick up for themselves and achieve success through their own hard work and determination. The precision with which the screenwriter handled this becomes even more evident with how she chose to resolve the story. The Clovers don't have the money to get the squad to nationals in Daytona. A less skillful writer would progress the story by having Torrance save the day by being a white savior and paying for the squad to get to the competition. That way she can be the hero, the Clovers can forgive her and she can absolve herself of all the guilt she feels, as well as the part she's played in stealing from them. And at first that's where it looks like the movie is going. Torrance gets her dad's company to write a check for the Clovers, but when she gives Gabrielle Union the check, instead of gladly taking it, she rips it up. Gabrielle Union then delivers the perfect articulation of why she won't take the money. Why do you have to be so mean? I'm just trying to do the right thing here. You want to make it right? Then when you go to nationals, bring it. Don't slack off because you feel sorry for us. That way, when we beat you, we'll know it's because we're better. And spoiler alert for this 20-year-old movie. They do get the money without the help of Torrance, and they win the finals. They got there completely on their own because the writer showed them the same amount of respect as she does Torrance. And because of that, when these rivals come together at the end with mutual respect, it feels authentic. You see that Torrance has fully learned from the experience and learned what it is to be an ally. And you see the Clovers rightfully get their dues without the help of anyone else. What once was a stock character has now been humanized, and it wasn't done so in a basic way. It was done by taking us on a journey, seeing them both fail and succeed. It was done by both making some fun of cheerleading, while also showing that it is a serious physical sport that requires a ton of hard work. It was done by both playing with the stereotypes as well as revealing that there is more to these characters. It takes its time to do that with a really mature plot in an immature setting. Yes, we still do see the unflattering stock character depiction of the cheerleader after the release of Bring It On. But like I said, stock characters aren't inherently bad, they serve their purpose. If that purpose is to quickly show the audience the social hierarchy in high school, then have at it. What Bring It On did do was one, make that version of the cheerleader happen far less frequently than it did in the 80s and 90s. Two, open the door for future fictional cheerleaders such as Claire Bennett in Heroes or Kim Possible or even Quinn Fabray in Glee to expand beyond the boxed-in expectations set for them before we got Bring It On, therefore giving the cheerleader a balance that other stock characters, like the jock, has received for decades. And finally, my favorite thing that Bring It On did is it made them the star of the show. No longer are they just shallow background characters that pop in for a scene to be mean and bully the protagonist. Repeatedly, we now see that even if the cheerleader isn't the main character, she's often the most memorable, the most captivating, the most loved. So, as we approach the 20th anniversary of the release of Bring It On, I just had to give this movie its props. That's it, thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed this video. Don't forget to give it a like if you did. This video is brought to you in part through supporters on Patreon. You can support the channel and get early access to my videos by going on patreon.com slash tropeanatomy. Again, thanks for watching. Bye. When I first laid eyes on you, I was reminded of a young Sue Sylvester. Though you don't have my bone structure.